Let's get into some prayer. I'm going to get on my knees. You feel that? Do the same. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move mightily, that you would transform, you would convict, you would teach, edify, encourage, exhort everything you do, Holy Ghost. Have your way and speak through me. Speak through me, Holy Spirit. Jesus, let your will be done here at this church service as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Woo, I'm excited for this message. Except I kind of I kind of lost my voice, but it's okay. All right. We're going to be talking about protecting your fruit. I want, before we begin, let's all stand up. And let's pray in the spirit. I don't want anybody going to sleep. All right. All right, come on. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Heavenly Father, we just ask right now, everyone be woken up. No distractions, no distractions. Father God, that if anyone has to use the restroom, they hold it, and they don't have to use it no more right now. Holy Ghost, have your way. Let's all say, Jesus! 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 Come on, clap for Jesus. All right, you guys can be seated. Everyone may be seated. All right. This is again going to be a, I don't know if you guys saw online, it's going to be a two-part series. Today I'm going to be speaking about half of it and um, next Saturday, the next half. So, I don't know who hasn't, if you guys know this, but producing fruit and bearing fruit are two different things. Producing fruit focuses on my work for God, while bearing fruit focuses on God's work through me. I'm going to say it again. Producing fruit focuses on my work for God, what I do for God. Bearing fruit, when I bear fruit, it focuses on what God is working through me. Everyone say, I produce fruit. Say, I bear fruit. All right. Regardless if we are producing or bearing fruit, we must preserve our harvest. When something is produced, it is made available to the person, right? It's something you can inspect. For example, if I... If I grow a tree and apples fall, I produce that fruit. I can inspect it. But when, but when something is, is born or bared, it's when you give birth to something. You become the father or mother of this object. It comes through you. For example, if my wife and I bear a child, it's because of our intimacy the child is birthed. It is a part of us directly. And by the way, today we had the gender reveal and we're having a, a daughter. So praise God. That's why I'm wearing this. Praise the Lord. But when we work at our jobs, we produce income. It's not as intimate, and it's added on to us through work. A, worth, a, a, a worker is worthy of his wages, right? Everyone say, protect the fruit. Look at your neighbor and say, I protect my fruit. All right, tonight for part one, we're going to be talking about bearing fruit and how to protect it. All right, bearing tonight. Next Saturday is going to be uh, producing so when you bear the fruit of the Spirit, it will become evident in the life of a believer as there is growth. The fruit becomes evidence of a transformed heart and mind. So let's go over the fruit of the Spirit. What are the different parts of the fruit of the Spirit? So everyone repeat after me. Love, joy, peace, faith, kindness, goodness, gentleness, patience, and self-control. There are nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit. Like if this was a fruit, there's nine different parts of the fruit. There's not different fruits. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. For example, again, if this was a fruit, for example, an apple, there's nine different parts of the apple, and that's the nine you just mentioned. Everyone say fruit of the Spirit. All right. Some of you guys become so busy trying to change the world for Christ, that you give no time to Christ to change you. Us, I said you guys, us, all of us. Sometimes we get so busy trying to change the world for God, trying to go out there and reach the lost, right? Trying to work, 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 that we don't give God time to change us. And that's an issue. If I focus on making sales for a business that I haven't fully established the foundation of the business will eventually what? Fall. If I haven't fully got my employees, set up my shop, 
got my legalities in order, and got the entire business ready to produce for, for me to make sales. And I go out there trying to make sales before it's ready. When the customers come in, what happens? The business falls. There's no foundation. There's, no, there, there's nothing for, for me to continue in longevity. It's the same thing in Christ. We try to go out there and start ministry. We try to go out there and start to do work for God, which is good. But if we don't have intimacy with God, we cannot bear fruit to continue and keep on. We will fall. God is not worried about how we work for him. Faith without works is dead, and he knows that. But sometimes God, most of the time, God wants us to have intimacy with him. I want to go over two scriptures regarding the production and the bearing of fruit. Uh, Deacon Joel, you read? Oh, no, it was prophecy. Amen. Prophecy, uh, we're going to start off. Um, Antoine, you can put up the scripture in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Go ahead, prophecy. Y'all give it up for prophecy. Come on. It's not his fault. It's Kevin's fault. It's on? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Go ahead, my brother. I love you, Kevin. <clears throat> but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. This is how we produce fruit. We produce fruit when we do what? We have intimacy. Intimacy is what produces and bear, like you bear fruit by, when you bear fruit through intimacy, you will uncontrollably produce fruit as well. I, I know this through testimony. When I first came to Christ, I was only about the production of fruit. I was all about evangelism, evangelism, cast out devils, heal the sick. I'm going to go out in the streets and do this 24-7 because that's what my heavenly father wants. I thought that that's what God wanted me to do all the time. And what I lacked was intimacy. I would wake up go in my closet, say my 20-minute prayer, I would, I would read my word and be like, yes, I'm gone. Boom, hit the streets. And I wouldn't be gone for the entire day, and I would not see the production of fruit. I'd be out there for hours evangelizing, and only actually, I'm only actually able to pray for one person the entire time. And I'm wondering, God, what's the issue? And I did that for so long, and God had so much grace. But then eventually God started showing me, you don't have to do all that work. Stay in me, and I got you. Stay in the secret place for hours, and you'll only have to be out there for 30 minutes. And it was hard because I was so used to work, work, work. But once I started gaining a systematic prayer, worship, and Bible reading life, a secret place life, alone, separate from the church, separate from my wife, separate from my brothers, separate from everybody, where it's me and God alone, because remember, he's a jealous God. He wants all of us alone. Is Coming together in the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints, is that good? Of course. But God wants, he would rather you seek him alone. He wants intimacy. And when I began to start seeking him alone, I wouldn't have to be out, outside longer than 15 minutes. We, me and Kevin would walk in the mall, and three encounters would happen in less than 10 minutes, all on video. All of them received. All of them were miracles, and we're ready to go. Because we had intimacy. Because me and Kevin woke up early, and I said, we're going to wake up at 5, and we're going to seek God for three hours. And Kevin, you're going to get out your bed. You're not going to lay in your bed. You're going to actually get up. And he would get up, and I would get up, and we'd go alone. He would be somewhere. I would be somewhere, and we would seek God, and we would pray in the spirit, and we would read the word, and we would worship God, and we'd come out in the glory. And everywhere we went was an encounter. It was literally everything we prayed for would happen quick because we seek, because he's the one that does it. Do you think God needs us to save a soul? Do you think God needs us to cast out a demon? God doesn't need us. He can do it on his own, but he wants to use us because he loves us. He wants to show us that there's purpose in the kingdom of God, that we can be used. Everyone say, I can be used. All right. Go ahead. Uh, prophecy, next one. Um, the, the whole one through five? Yes, sir. All right, John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself 
unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Look at that. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Everyone say, Jesus is the vine. Jesus is the vine. And say, I am the branch. I am the branch. Now look at your neighbor and say, I need Jesus. Uh, Deacon Joel, if you could bring, bring up the, um, the objects, please. While he's bringing that up, these two passages are invitations to intimacy. I want to show you guys. You can bring it right to the front. I'm going to show you guys what happens. What can happen when we don't have intimacy with God? You see, I even, in my front, in the front of my house, this pot was laid perfectly out there. And as I was consecrating to the Lord yesterday, finishing up the sermon and praying over it, the Lord in my secret place showed me this exact pot. This pot right here, as you can see, is bearing no fruit, thorns, thistles, right? He showed me there's a lot of people who are growing trees as such that aren't producing fruit. But he told me to use this as an example to show the body of Christ how it looks when you don't reside in him. Because people believe the doctrine that once you're saved, nothing that you could, that for the rest of your life, no matter what you do, you will make it to heaven. No matter if you go back to the club, no matter if you go back to the alcohol and women and weed and men and, and porn and witchcraft, and you could do whatever you want because you already gave your life to Christ and that's it. But according to what we just read, if you don't re reside in the vine, you'll be broken off literally as such, and that's hell thrown into hell. That's literally what happens to us. He's the one that produces everything. Without the vine, you cannot produce fruit. You need the vine for the vitamins and nutrients to the branches, to the leaves, to the fruit. But if we're not residing in the vine, if we're not in Christ, if he's not in us, if we're not reading his word, if we're not praying to him and worshiping him, if we're not having an intimate relationship with him in the secret place, you know what happens? We get broken off and thrown into hell according to that word. What prophecy just read, that's what happens. So I'm going to say it again. You can come to the church house, and that's good. You can show up to revival events, and that's good. You can listen to Christian worship music and Christian rap on the road. That's good. But if that's all you're doing for intimacy, you need to repent tonight. You need to leave here different because it's intimacy that keeps you grounded and keeps you on the vine. People get deceived so easily. How many people here have been frustrated, angry, depressed, anxiety? I'm going to tell you something. If you're dealing with those feelings and you're walking in it, it means you're lacking intimacy with Jesus. Because no matter what trial you go through, I was just telling prophecy this, no matter what level of faith you're in, there's always going to be a new devil in trial. People think when they come out the season they're in. People think, oh, I, I just need my wife back. I just need my husband back. I just need to get married. I just need my son. I just need my daughter. I just need this job that's going to pay more. I just need my breakthrough. They think once the breakthrough comes that, that they're going to be in heaven. No, there's going to be a new giant. We live life going through trials consistently. That is why we suffer. And we, we account all the suffering, nothing compared to the glory to come that's within us. We get to experience heaven on earth in the secret place. We get to experience a part of heaven here on earth when we reside in Christ in intimacy. The presence of God is a taste of heaven that we can experience along with Jesus. The presence is tangible. The anointing, everything that God gives you in the secret place is beautiful. That's where the deliverance happens. Some of us go from church to church, from man and woman of God, from man of God to woman of God, to man of God to woman of God, looking for someone to cast the devil out of us. The issue the majority of the time is they have no intimacy. When your identity, we're speaking about this today, when your identity is in deliverance, you have an issue. Because you know what's going to happen in the end of times? Muslims going to be having videos casting demons out. Witches going to be having videos casting demons out. Freemasons. You see, I'm, I'm going somewhere deep that y'all don't want to, y'all like, what? I thought it was only Christians. Bro, the sons of Sceva, I just... I was reading it to the men of God. They were casting demons out by the name of Jesus Christ, and they were not born again. So if you think 
that only Christians filled with the Spirit can cast out demons. You are deceived in the end times. There's going to be a whole bunch of people casting demons out. New Age witches are going to be, they, they already do it. They already do it. They conjure spirits and people. They can make a video that looks like deliverance, but it ain't deliverance. But they can make, the demon will make a whole show. The demon will fall to the ground. Yeah. And, and, and then if, you ever, if you've ever casted out a Jezebel spirit, a Jezebel, you know how that witch works. As soon as you lay hands, she does a whole show, falls to the ground, and, you, and, she, and she like, and if you're not mature in deliverance, you would think that the person got delivered. But you know that that Jezebel came out when you hear that scream. You see, I just, I just taught some people in here. How do I know this? Because I've casted out many demons, hundreds and hundreds of deliverances. And then it got to the point where I just, it did, it, it, I, I, I didn't care for it as much. I knew it was real, and I will cast out a demon if the Lord wants me to, but I didn't focus on it. I realized that my relationship with God was more important than deliverance, than healing, than any of that. That stuff is added. You seek the kingdom and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. It's the Holy Ghost who casts out demons anyways. It's the Holy Ghost who heals the sick anyways. The non-believers and even believers, they need to see that 100%. Y'all see my videos. Miracles, miracles, signs, and wonders. But that's not... That's not identity. That's not relationship. That's just, that's just what he adds on to you to use you. But does he need you to go lay hands on someone in a gas station to cast out a devil? No, I've heard stories of people screaming out to God on top, on the top of a rooftop about to commit suicide and get delivered from demons. He didn't, there was nobody up there with him. Tonight we're going to talk about bearing fruit through intimacy because people need to leave for a whole year. From the house church to now, I was preaching on secret place, preaching on secret place, preaching on secret place. Intimacy, intimacy. Come back to your first love. Intimacy. And we saw so much fruit. We saw so many people bearing the love, the joy, the gentleness, the goodness, the kindness, faith, self-control, and patience of the spirit, including myself and my wife. So now that we have a new round of people and we're going to have more people coming, if we don't preach and we don't teach and we don't understand the revelation of the secret place, people will fall away. You'll last for a few months, a year, and go right back to the world because you don't know the goodness of God. If the goodness of God to you is seeing a deliverance, then entertainment is your goodness. It says in the Bible that even Jesus did not commit onto men because he knew their hearts. They just saw him casting out devils, healing the sick, doing a whole bunch of miracles, and they were praising his name, the Messiah, and it says he did not commit onto them because he knew them. That means he didn't worry about them. He said, okay, cool, I'm out. We out. Come on, let's go. And they left because he knew that their heart was all about entertainment. Their heart was all about the show. If the show and the entertainment is your identity, you have a very serious issue. Everyone say intimacy. I feel convictions in the house. Um, prophecy continue. Um, verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in Stop you. Stop right there. And my what prophecy? And my words. Words abide in you. Continue. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Stop right there. You will ask what you desire. If his words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be answered. So that means we have to pray according to what? The word of God. If we don't pray according to his will, it will not be answered. Some of us are praying prayers and wondering why God is not answering it. Because maybe the prayer you're praying is not, a, is not according to the will of God. But if you abide in him, read it again, prophecy. Seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Continue. And what is all of it for? By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. You will be my learners, my disciples, so that the Father in heaven is glorified by the fruit that you bear. That when you walk into a store and the glory and the anointing is so heavy on you, people are just pouring out their heart to you and confessing everything they're dealing with. That when you walk in an area where someone's angry and murderous and, 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 and they're screaming at a teller and you say, hey, let me talk to you, let me pray for you. Now they're breaking down telling you that their mother just died yesterday. It's that type of fruit that brings people to Christ. It's the love of God that brings people to Christ. Some people say they know love, but you cannot know love if you do not know Jesus because Jesus is love. 
Everyone say Jesus is love. Jesus is love. Everyone say pride is not love. Pride is not love. That rainbow, the LGBTQ ABCD community where has that stuff is not love. They say love, love, love. They don't know love because they don't know God. They don't know love, and you know what happens? They go sleep around with everybody else. They, they can't stay even in a faithful relationship. I've asked many homosexuals, do you know any homosexual that's in a faithful relationship and waited till marriage to get to have sex? They just said, nope. And even the ones who get married, they have open relationships because the demons inside of them cannot, cannot stand commitment, cannot stand with being with one person, the demons need to attach to more people. Soul ties, soul ties, more power. The atmosphere within the temple needs to increase with darkness in order for the demon to be satisfied because ultimately that demon wants to kill, steal, and destroy that person. Because that person has the potential to go to heaven. That demon doesn't. The minute that person started moving in iniquity, they opened the door and let the demon in. We're going to talk about demons because they're real. People literally don't believe in deliverance, don't believe in demons. I'm going to tell you something. A non-believer could have a demon and a Christian could have a demon. I've seen it. I've seen devils cast out of more Christians than non-believers. If you don't believe it, you go ask the Lord. Go read. Where did Jesus go? He went to the temples to cast demons out of the Jewish religious leaders, the Jewish people. Our body's a temple. Do you think your body's only a temple when you get saved? Your body always been a temple. Catch that in the spirit. Did y'all know that the temple built by Solomon in the book of Ezekiel chapter 41, it talks about how our temple has 93 rooms. Did y'all know that? 93 rooms. How can a legion of demons, think about it, the man had a legion. A legion, according to the word of God, they used, again, Roman, Roman centurion terms. A legion was two to 3,000 Roman centurion soldiers. So when the man said, I am the, the demon, the legion, spoke, I am legion, right? Y'all know, know what I'm talking about. The man had a legion of demons in him. That's two to 3,000 demons. If we look at a person's temple in the physical, like, oh, a demon can't fit in that little bit. No, in the spirit, we are literally houses, temples. The blind man who couldn't see when Jesus prayed for him with the spit, what's the first thing he saw? Trees. Isn't that crazy? He didn't see them as little vessels. He saw them as trees, tall. We got to understand that the spirit realm is different. 93 rooms. If this place had 93 rooms, how big would it be? Think about it. That's how two to 3,000 demons could fit in the temple. Our body's a house. What did Jesus say? He said, before you take the spoils, before, before you go in, you have to bind the what? The strong man. Think about this. If I go to steal, if I go to rob somebody's house and somebody's in there with a gun, I can't take nothing unless I tie them up. I got to tie them up hostage, then take all their stuff. That's what Jesus was trying to say. He was teaching people deliverance. You got to bind the strong man, then take the spoils. And even when a demon comes out, what happens to the demon? It goes and gets seven more demons, more wicked than itself, and comes back to enter the home it was once in. Finding it clean and swept. But if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, can the, can the demon answer? No. So what do they do? They watch you. They watch you to the day you die. You, you die. They watch you and they monitor you. Monitoring spirits. I'm getting, I'm getting real spiritual now. Because people need to know this. And they're called familiar spirits. What's a familiar spirit? Something you once had that you're familiar to. And familial meaning it's in your bloodline. It's passed on for generations upon generations. So, like, for instance, myself, if one of my familial spirits is anger, religion, lust, whatever it is, those demons, to the day I die, are going to always try to come back. And they're going to try to mess with me. Because they know by chance that that's the easiest way to come back in. So if at any point I get so frustrated and I give in and I say I'm departing or I'm going to be a worker of iniquity now, which means I know that sin is wrong, but I'm going to do it. They're, they're, you can fall, you're good by the blood. You can mess up, you're good by the blood. As long as you confess and you repent, you're good every single time. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. And as you grow in the faith, you'll understand how powerful the blood really is. But it's when you know that this Hennessy, you shouldn't be drinking it and getting drunk, but you just start. 
Oh, nobody's looking. I'll be all right. Now you lit. Now you're in the club. You wake up the next morning. Ah, uh, it's all good. And then it becomes, you know what? This bottle of Hennessy becomes a normality again. It becomes seven times worse because now you've allowed that same demon in plus other demons. Now not only do you have addiction, but you have murder. You have homosexuality. You have the spirit of molestation. Now you're trying. Now, you see, why do people, think about it. Why do people molest people? I don't even know why I'm going to this. But why do you think people molest people and rape people? Do you think it's because they want to? Do you know a lot of these rapists and molesters, they are tormented, literally? Tormented. Literally tormented. They hate themselves. A lot of them commit suicide. It's because they have demons. It's because it was passed down because they were molested or raped. And it's generational. And it continues to happen. So when you get molested and you get, and you get raped, you need to forgive. You need to let go and you need to get delivered. Because if you don't get delivered, what happens? Those demons that are dwelling in you can start to manifest whenever you start walking in your calling. I want to be used by God. I want, to be, I want to do more in Christ. Those demons can't go to where you're going next, to the next faith and glory level. So you need to get delivered. That's why there's so many Christians on fire for a year and then they just fall off. So on fire and they get caught in, in adultery, get caught in alcoholism. You're like, man, you were on fire for a whole year, bro. Why are you back in the club? Ah, forget Jesus, the same guy that was on the street corner talking about Jesus Christ is king, in the club drunk, th throwing the middle finger up at street preachers. I've seen that. I've seen it. Because they need deliverance. It's real. And the best deliverance is in the secret place. I'll tell you something. The best deliverance is one-on-one -on -one with God. Presence when the glory is so strong. No demon can dwell. I literally can hear the, the Holy Ghost tell me, you're about to get delivered. You ready? And I can hear it come out, and I'm, uh, and I'm coughing up, or I'm crying. I could hear the voice of God, the Holy Spirit telling me it's time. This can't go where you're going next. You ready? Let's go. Self-deliverance is real, and that comes through intimacy by abiding in him, by being in the secret place, by reading the word and catching a revelation like, I was wrong this whole time. What? Deliverance. And it doesn't have to be a full ah, manifestation. It could be just revelation and realizing you're wrong. And being like, God, thank you. And he reveals it. The sword of the spirit cuts you. Isn't that beautiful? Everyone say intimacy. intimacy. Everyone say the word of God. The word of God. So when you abide in Jesus and his word, you will desire what he desires. And what you ask will automatically be done according to his will and it will be answered as you grow in the faith and as you start to know the word you know what happens when you pray prayers start quick it don't take long no more you start praying things next day it happens like oh that was quick jesus wait ooh, and then your faith begins to increase how many y'all want to be like that where prayers are answered quick that takes faith and the word faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god continue prophecy verse nine as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no love than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So no greater love than someone who lays down their life. Who laid down their life for us? So what now what are we called to do for Jesus? Lay down our life. Click. We're called to lay down our life because if we're truly his friend and we truly love him, we've given up everything. It's not hard to understand. I know people that come to the church houses for years and don't want to give up. They know what they got to do, but they don't want to give up because they don't want Jesus. They love Satan more. Tonight's the night where people are going to come to this altar and get delivered and give up the world. I'm telling you something. In Christ, it's a million times better. In Christ, you get the love and joy and peace that you never had. In Christ, you have purpose. In Christ, he gives you the desires of your heart. But in Christ, the intimacy 
And the love that God gives you alone is better than anything in this world. That's why when we're sitting here singing, I just love, I really am singing to God because I love him. Not because of what he gives me. I'm a, not because of what, I, it's not even running through my mind. Sometimes I have to literally remember and say, thank you, God, for these blessings. But he knows my heart. Literally, my alone time with God is everything to me. I love him. We have to increase in love and, and, and intimacy with God so that we'll build a deeper relationship. Continue reading, prophecy. Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. The Lord has a of, of his word to us by the spirit because we are his friends. How many read the word before receiving the Holy Ghost? Before receiving the, the Holy Spirit. And it was boring. It was whack. Made no sense. Stupid. Written by man. I'm never reading this thing again. But then when you receive the spirit of God dwelling in you and you read it, you're like, oh my God. It's alive. It's because he's revealed it to you. He's given you what he has. It's an inheritance as a son, as a daughter of God. He gives you the revelation. He gives you the understanding. He gives you the wisdom and instruction. It's only through God. You can't get it on your own. Continue. 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. He chose us. You didn't choose him. Continue. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Read that again, that whatever what? Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So whatever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, he'll give you if you have a relationship with him. Whatever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, he will give you because you have a relationship with him. When you have a relationship with somebody, you're not going to ask for something outlandish that goes against what they believe. Um, if my wife, if my wife doesn't want to go to California because of earthquakes, I'm not going to be like, I'm going to Cali. No, I'm not going to do that because she's going to hate me. She's going to get mad. I'm not going to go to California. I'm not going to move to Cali because she don't like earthquakes. I love her. So when we have an intimate relationship with God, we're going to ask things according to his will, and he's going to answer it every single time. And we ask through the Son. Why do we ask in the name of Jesus? Because it's Jesus, the fullness of God bodily, that received the full inheritance from the Father. And now, through belief in him, we receive the same full inheritance, and we're adopted into the body of Christ. We're redeemed and reconciled back to the Father through the blood of Jesus, only because of Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. Jesus. Say I'm reconciled. I'm reconciled. Say I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. There's somebody in here that doesn't know what, reconcile me, what reconciliation means. It means when you got beef with somebody and you got an issue and you make it right and now you're back with them again. That's what happened. When you were born into your sinful nature, you were not a son or daughter of God. I'm sorry to tell you. If you don't receive, if you have not received the Holy Spirit, you are not a son or daughter of God. You're not. You're a son or daughter of the devil. You are. It's until you receive the spirit of God by belief in Jesus Christ, by faith in Christ, that you become a child of God. And the Bible says you are adopted into a royal priesthood. You're now royalty. You go from being nothing to royalty, receiving a whole inheritance. And it could happen in a second. A drug addict could be sitting here on drugs, strung out, give his life to Christ, and the next minute be a king. A prostitute could be over there having sex all day, come to a church service, give her life to Christ. Now she's a queen and receives the full inheritance. Next day, she's casting devils out of people. Next day, she's over there praying in tongues. Next day, she's, she's receiving everything that the Lord has for her because she understands what, he, what he's given her. Isn't that amazing? Continue. Verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Amen. Everyone say, protect your fruit. Protect. So look, we are called to abide in Christ and his word and teach others how to do the same. We bear the fruit of the spirit to love one another with his love. So we receive, we're able to bear the fruit of the spirit for others. I'm going to say it again. We bear the fruit of the spirit. for. We cannot bear the fruit of the spirit in our own strength, in our own might. We cannot sit here and be like, I'm going to be joyful today if you're angry. I don't know who's tried it in here, but it doesn't work. Because when you don't abide in him, it's not going to happen. 
That's what happens when people are dealing like, I was just talking in the front with a few people. One of the sisters was saying she was uh, dealing with double-mindedness. And I told them, double-mindedness is a lack of humility and a lack of faith in Jesus Christ. Because when you read the word and you have an intimate relationship with him, you'll believe it at face value. A lot of times people who are dealing with double-mindedness need deliverance from rejection and pride. The, the rejection that came, at, came in when they got molested, beat up, bullied, or whatever it was, that spirit has not left. And it causes them to be prideful, to act like everything's cool. I'm straight. I know what I'm doing. I'm holy. I know the word. I, that's what it causes them to do. And then you know what happens? Now they're double-minded and unstable in all their ways. I want to do this. Do this. I want, that's because they don't have, they haven't broken, got delivered, number one. And they need, they need to rely on the word. But if you read the word... And you don't believe it. Like I'm talking about when I read this word that you did not choose me, but I chose you. God, I didn't choose. You really chose me. I believe it. Like you chose me. You chose me. I believe it. But if you can't believe the word, it's because you're lacking humility because of things in the past. That's why Christians do need deliverance. Amen. Amen. All right. Everyone say Intimacy. I'm going to read something. In the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 2, it says, John the Baptist proclaimed, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at near. And he also said in verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So we keep the fruit, bearing the fruit through what? Repentance. So when we repent, where do we repent? In the secret place. How are you going to know you're wrong if you don't have a relationship with God? How are you going to know? How are you going to tell him, I repent, I confess, and I'm changing if you don't speak to him? Some of you don't understand intimacy, and you pray vain, repetitious prayers. You pray Catholic prayers. You pray prayers over and over again because you don't know that you can have a relationship with God. You even pray with a tone that sounds holy. The tone and the, the volume of your prayers do not make it more anointed. You can whisper and have, a, have the power of God behind your voice. Y'all know that? All right. So I'm going to read one more um, chapter. Uh, if, you, if you guys could pull it out to the book of uh, Genesis, we're going to skip through, Antoine. I want everyone to pull out your Bible, to, uh, if you want to, to Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, verses 10 through 22. I want, I want to read something, some deep revelation. Everyone stand up real quick. Come on. Hey, when we get into the word, people start getting, oh, I don't want it. Let's everyone just say this. Say, Jesus. 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 Now stretch a little bit. Stretch. All right. Y'all can sit down. All right. Last one, I promise. I love the Bible a lot. Last one. All right. The book of Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. Listen to this. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. So he, Jacob came to a place. He took a stone to sleep on like a pillow. And he lay down to that place to sleep. And listen to this. This gets crazy. Then he dreamed and behold a ladder. Everyone say ladder. Was set up on earth. And its, and it, its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending. That means they were going up and down. Jacob literally saw a ladder to heaven and angels going up and down the ladder. And behold, the Lord Jesus stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. That's deep. Then Jacob, he woke up from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the same stone he slept on, the pillow that he had put his head on, and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it, anointing oil. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been loose previously. Then look, look at this. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me 
and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on. Everyone say bread to eat. Say clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Last one. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I shall surely give a tenth to you. This is before the law. This is before the Levitical law, the Mosaic law was established when they asked for tithes to give to the Levite, to the, Le the Levitical priesthood. This proves anybody that thinks tithing was an old law. This is outside of the law. Jacob seen a ladder go to heaven. Jesus talked to him and literally established Bethel and said, I'm going to give you a tenth, God, of everything you give me because you know why? He understood principles. It's a kingdom principle to tithe. We can tithe to Starbucks if you want. You can tithe to McDonald's. You can tithe to wherever. But look, when you start understanding that I need to give a tenth of my salary, of my monthly income to the church house. Look, if you get established at any other church, whatever church you become a member of and you receive any type of spiritual food from, you need to sow and tithe into that ministry. Not just here, any church. Tithing is a kingdom principle. Sowing is a kingdom principle. I wanted to show you guys because I know that myself, when I first came to Christ, I went through a very religious season where I thought tithing was part of the law until God broke me down in scripture and showed me where I was wrong. Abraham took the, he took over a city, killed his enemies, took his, the enemy's spoils, saw Melchizedek and gave a tenth on to Melchizedek, who was a revelation of Jesus Christ. So tithing is biblical. So what we're going to do now is if um, we're going to have the buckets here. If anyone wants to bring it to the front, you don't have to. And we're going to do the offering. We're going to also um, put up the cash app, ways to give, PayPal, Venmo, Zelle. And if you want to bring it to the altar and you want to pray for whatever you're giving, which is the Bible says bring your gifts to the altar, that's why people do that, um, you may. You may come if you understand um, kingdom principles. Amen.